Here's the story. You know, I woke up this morning, I looked in the mirror, and I, I made a realization. My hair looks ridiculous. I know. You don't have to write in. You don't have to tell me. I know I look like a poor man's Gavin Newsom. I'm moving on. I'm Dan Haggerty also. Welcome to the story. Have you had enough politics? I mean, we had a full day of election coverage yesterday. We spent about 10 minutes of our 30-minute show here talking about all the big races. Then I helped anchor our streaming show last night. That went on for like about two hours or so. The morning show's been all over it. The noon show, the four, the five, politics, politics, politics. There could not be possibly more to talk about. Oh, but there is, and it's our big story again tonight, because even though voting ended last night, the election did not. The race for Portland's mayor, for instance, still is not settled right now. Two Portland city commissioners are still up in the air. The Democratic Secretary of State primary is separated by about 100 votes. Politics is fun, and I know it's true because I keep repeating it, and if I keep repeating it, it becomes true. But it's also extremely serious, and nobody knows that more than the voters in Baker City, who last night voted overwhelmingly to give their city council the authority to sell a 1995 backhoe. And I'm not even trying to make that sound funny. That is the exact verbatim of the language on the Secretary of State's website. See, it turns out the Baker City Charter forbids the council from selling surplus equipment that is worth more than $10,000. And based on my Googling, that puppy should go for about $25K. Regardless, voters don't seem to be as interested in the transaction as I am because Baker City also voted last night to amend its charter so that they no longer have to hold an entire election to sell a piece of construction equipment. So now let's turn to some of the more, I don't know, minor races, you could say, like the race to be Portland's mayor. And this one is really exciting because we really don't know at this point actually who is going to win yet. But it is getting closer and closer by the second. Every time the numbers come out, they're closer. Mayor Wheeler, see, he needed at least 50% of the vote plus one to win outright and remain our, our, our mayor. But right now, it's not quite clear if he's going to get that, with the next closest challenger, Sarah Ayanna Roan, taking almost a quarter of the votes. If those numbers hold steady, that would mean that Wheeler and Ayanna Roan would face off against each other in November during the general election. And it's looking more and more likely that that is going to be the outcome. But we are not quite ready to call it yet here on this story. And think of it this way. Think of, it, think of where we are right now in Portland. If Ayanna Roan pulls off a win in November, for instance, there is a chance Portland could see its first all-female city council ever. And I say there's a chance because two of the three Portland city commissioners races didn't have an outright winner last night. For the race to fill the seat of late Commissioner Nick Fish, it looks like it's going to be between former Multnomah County Commissioner Loretta Smith and education leader Dan Ryan. But, you know, obviously there's still some room right now for Tara Hurst and Julia DeGraw to sneak into that second place spot to force the runoff there. Now, Loretta Smith, you may remember, she actually ran for Portland City Council in 2018 against Joanne Hardesty, who beat her. But there were some pretty intense moments in their campaign. For instance, they were both at a joint event one night. Hardesty brought a person on stage who Smith says had previously made some inappropriate comments about her appearance. And Hardesty later apologize for this move but if Smith holds on to her lead she wins in November the two of them will be working on council together and that could get interesting now as for Chloe Udaly's seat she's holding on to a very slim lead right now over Mingus Maps who clearly has the best name in any of these elections he used to work for her actually and now is very critical of her policies it's still too close to call here but those two appear likely to head into a runoff this November and we say it's too close because of Sam Adams there who used to be the mayor of course just barely edged out into that third place seat right now. And if he stays there in third place, he is out of the race. Which brings us to literally the only city, city council race that is in stone tonight, position one to succeed Amanda Fritz, who chose not to run for re-election. We're talking about Carmen Rubio, who not only won in a landslide, but she made history as Portland's very first Latinx city commissioner. By the way, uh, younger viewer, viewers, I know you know what I mean when I say Latinx. Non-millennial viewers, Latinx is a newer, popular, gender-neutral way of referring to people of Latin descent, just so there's no confusion. Now, Rubio's election is part of a trend, you could say. In the past few years, we've seen more and more Latinx people elected in Oregon for both local and state offices. And it does make sense since the Latinx population is booming and has been for years. Right now, about 10% of Portland is Latinx. More than 13% of Oregon as a whole is. And the Latinx population is actually growing faster right now than the population of the entire state.
Now, one of the first races called last night was a big win for Metro's homeless services tax. Voters approved it with a 16-point margin, although support did vary depending on where you live. It was estimated that this would bring in about $250 million per year to help the homeless crisis. But the, uh, the pandemic that we're going through right now may have changed that dollar figure a little bit because our economy has taken such a hit. Officials say that the revenue that this brings in might be lower in the first year or actually lower in the first few years. But what hasn't changed is the plan to figure out how the money will be spent. The money will go toward things like housing assistance and mental health or addiction treatment, but the nitty gritty details like which groups will get that money and how much they'll get, those still need to be ironed out. So Maggie Vespa went to find out how this is all going to work. We'll start with a refresher on who will be taxed and by how much. The now approved measure will place a marginal 1% tax on high earning individuals and couples and on businesses that generate more than $5 million a year in revenue. The plan for how to spend the money raised is flexible by design. The 10 year measure didn't dictate where the money will go, it dictated how that will be decided year after year. Metro President Lynn Peterson says the council is meeting with local groups that help the home. Uh, tomorrow. What we're going to be able to do is just tell them a little bit about what progress we've made prior to the election night, uh, which is that we have started conversations with uh, both the state and the city of Portland to figure out who can actually collect uh, the tax. But we want to point out before any groups can collect this money, they'll have to put in requests through their respective county, either Multnomah, Clackamas, or Washington, the three that make up Metro. Now, stick with me here. Those requests will be considered by special committees made up of government officials, service providers, and people who have experienced homelessness. Each county's committee will then bring the requests they've approved to a similar committee at Metro who will have the final say. And we're told all of these committees, by the way, all of these groups still have yet to be formed. That's going to likely happen, we're told, over the summer. And then the revenue will start flowing in next year. Here's what we do know about current spending priorities. About 45% of the money raised by this tax will go to Multnomah County, 33% to Washington County, and close to 21% goes to Clackamas County. Those allotments can change year to year based on need and population growth. It's worth noting voters in Clackamas County, the one with the least amount of money headed their way, were not on board with the tax. 53% of them voted against it. It was voters in Washington and especially Multnomah County who put this over the top. It's, it costs money to help people. Johnny Fisher yeah. and Americo Hernandez it's aren't surprised by that contrast. They work with Do Good Multnomah, a group that helps homeless veterans across the metro area. And this is my penthouse. A few years ago, staff opened this tiny house village for vets in Clackamas. They say homelessness around here is less in your face than it is in Portland, but the need is there. In fact, outreach workers tell Hernandez it's growing in light of the pandemic. They're seeing people who are experiencing homelessness for the first time, 50 years old, 60 years old, and they never thought this would happen, and they're getting help. So in turn, groups like Do Good Multnomah are even more relieved that the measure was passed. Um, but regardless of whether it really benefits us as an organization at all, it, it, that, that's kind of a side thing. Bottom line is the services are going to be there, yeah. and even if it's not us, um, an organization is going to be there to be able to use the funds to be able to help and assist people. All right, Maggie Vespa joining us now. Maggie, I find it interesting that this has already been voted on and passed, but there still remains a lot of confusion about how exactly this tax works, who is going to be taxed, how they're going to be taxed, and we need to explain that, again, this is a marginal tax. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not on a lot of people's uh, you know, radar until election night. That happens sometimes. So, again, it's a marginal tax, which means it's a tax on a person's income above a certain level. So I'm going to show you again the numbers that we showed you at the top of the story and kind of walk through this. This tax affects individuals who make $125,000 or more a year and couples who make more than $200,000 a year. So for clarity, let's stick with the individuals and just use that example. This tax affects a person's pay above that $125,000 mark, meaning if you make $126,000 a year, you will pay a 1% tax on the difference or a 1% tax on $1,000 in that case. And that's what a marginal tax is. It's not a tax on your entire income. It's a tax on the difference or above a certain threshold, basically. So I just wanted to walk through that one more time. Yeah, I think it's worth clarifying. Now, this is going to be a substantial amount of money, but 
there's so much need that it could go to a bunch of different places. Will the public have an opportunity to weigh in on how this money is going to be spent? They will. I mean, we talked about all of those committees in the piece. Well, those committees have to have their decisions approved by the Metro Council and by counties commissions, you know, the commissioners that we all elect. So when that happens, when those final decisions are made, there will be time for public comment, we're told. That's what Lynn Peterson with Metro told us. So that's good to keep in mind. And for those who are interested, just keep an eye on this progress, which, of course, we will too. Absolutely. Maggie Vespa, thank you. Okay, one more politics thing before we go on to talk about Oregon's unemployment crisis. All the huge issues that came out of last night's election. We got Portland's historically diverse city council lineup passing a landmark tax that we just mentioned, despite so many people being out of work and businesses struggling to survive. And you know what? We didn't even get into the fact that the city of Beaverton literally changed its entire style of government. But if you ask CNN, the only thing that happened last night in Oregon was this that Oregon Republicans nominated a conspiracy theorist to run against Senator Jeff Merkley in November. Joe Ray Perkins is all in on the QAnon conspiracy theory, uh, which is, in all honesty, so convoluted, I even have a tough time beginning how to explain it to you. Roughly, she believes that there is a high-level government official known as Q dropping online clues about government employees being involved in a massive conspiracy and that the military convinced Donald Trump to run for president to break it all up. See, when you lay it all out, it makes total sense, right? Now, we asked ourselves as we were putting the show together today, how do you draw the line between covering a serious candidate and elevating a conspiracy theory that really has no basis in reality? There might not be a right answer to that, but we thought that you deserve to know what the national media is saying about Oregon's election last night. All right, that's it. No more politics. You made it. Now let's talk about something a little lighter. Oregon's completely overwhelmed unemployment system. I had a chance to talk with a rep from the State Employment Department, and she said, believe it or not, Oregon is catching up. In fact, nine out of ten claims have been processed at this point, which I think is pretty good since there isn't a system in the country that's designed to process the influx in cases we've seen. More than 400,000 people have filed for unemployment in Oregon over the past two months. And if you're good at math, you've started to figure out the bad news here. So even with nine out of ten people getting their money, that still leaves tens of thousands of people who haven't seen a dime. And if there's anything that rivals the pain of waiting for your money, it may be waiting on hold with the employment office. Frank sent me this email. He said, my wife and I spent the entire morning with each of us trying our respective phones to contact the state. We called together about 500 times. We finally got through, but were immediately put on hold. We sat on hold for three hours, and then the line disconnected through no fault of our own. You know how many emails I've gotten that have been like identical to that? So here's the deal. The part about getting hung up on, that wasn't your fault, not at all. In fact, they're blaming that on a glitch in the system that has now been fixed, or so I'm told. But the wait times are insane, and they're still insane. And because of that glitch getting fixed, they've gotten even worse. I did ask the employment spokesperson today what they're doing about that and why they don't offer to put you in a queue, for instance, to be called back instead of wasting your entire day on hold. That was something that we looked into as an option in the very early days of this. And at that point in time, uh, if you called in and the wait time was still, you know, if it was three hours or something, so if you called in at four um, and then the wait time was three hours, uh, you would be told that you were going to get a call back. And then when the phones end for the day, you would get dropped. And so it would replace one problem with another one. And the next question that follows is then why don't you take calls 24 seven, right? And the thing about our systems is that every day they require to actually do the work of paying the claims. We need to have that processing time happen and we have to have maintenance, regularly scheduled maintenance to keep our systems up and running. Now you're probably thinking, oh yeah, the systems, those computers from the 1980s that you never upgraded even though you got the federal money to do so years ago. Well, I asked about that too. I actually asked a lot about, about a lot of other stuff too. We talked for more than an hour and right now the story team is building our coverage for later this week. I just kind of wanted to let you know what we were working on. And yes, I asked about the new PUA claims and the waiting week and what's going to happen with that and a lot of stuff. So give us a little bit of time to put this all together and stay tuned. Pretty soon, Portlanders might be crossing the Columbia to buy a whole lot more than just Sudafed. 
and a viewer had a question about a couple of races not on her ballot, and even though the election was last night, we're going to go ahead and answer it anyway. And then I mentioned a lot of you are still emailing us your memories of the Mount St. Helens eruption, and that's fine. Keep them coming. In fact, I'm going to share a few more when the story continues. All right, welcome back. So, uh, you know, I forget a lot of people are still at this point finding the show, the story. And if you're one of them and you're just tuning in, or maybe this is your second or third time watching us, welcome. Uh, I know a lot more of you are at home at six o'clock than you're used to being home. Maybe you're trying on us on for size. And I, I hope we're a really good fit. We love seeing you. And we think that you're going to like it around here because we do this really cool thing where we actually talk to you and we answer your questions. You have a real voice here. A lot of people write in, they use the hashtag HeyDan on Twitter, or they'll email us at the story at kgw.com. Like like Jen Lord, for instance, who had a question about her ballot. See, she's an unaffiliated voter in Washington County. She said, I noticed that I could only vote for the measures and judges only. Why can I not vote for a district attorney and the secretary of state? See, we get this question a lot, actually. And it's always worth a good reminder that in Oregon, being an unaffiliated voter and being an independent are not the same thing. There is an independent party that elects its own candidates. But if you are an unaffiliated voter like Jen, see, you cannot vote in partisan, for partisan candidates in primary elections. So that includes the president, Senate, secretary of state, that sort of stuff, which is why Jen didn't see those races on her unaffiliated ballot. As for why Jen didn't see the Multnomah County DA's race on her ballot, that's a simple reason. She doesn't live in Multnomah County. She's in Washington County, and they have their own DA who wasn't up for re-election this year. So I hope that answers your question, Jen. Another question coming in, this one from Aaron Gentry. Aaron wants to know, is there any info on when camping will be allowed again? See, this is actually kind of a surprisingly complicated answer because there are a lot of exceptions, and the rules vary depending on what side of the Columbia River that you live on. See. In Oregon, all overnight camping is still a no-go at this point. It's not allowed. The state did open up a few state parks back on May 6th. I'm sure you remember that, but only for day use. The Oregon State Parks website has an incredible resource where you can see the status of every park in the state. And here's a hint. If you live in northwest Oregon, there really isn't that much out there. If you live in Washington, camping is only allowed for small groups in counties that have entered phase two of Washington's reopening plan, which could be uh, pretty good news for Clark County. It's one of the counties that got greenlit from Governor Inslee to apply to enter phase two. And I know we say it a lot, but remember, Washington and Oregon's phases are a little bit different. Washington's phase two is a lot more like Oregon's phase one, and even then there are some differences. But Aaron, back to you. If Clark County enters phase two, that would mean you and no more than four people could go camping there. So for my Southwest Washington peeps, that means that Clark, Skamania, and Waukeacum are all in phase two right now. Cowlitz and Klickitat counties still aren't eligible, though. This is really something we ought to feel good about in the state of Washington. Uh, the ability of people going back to work, the ability of people going back to restaurants uh, after this most difficult time. So as we talk about the eligibility here, the counties that are able to enter phase two had to record fewer than 10 new coronavirus cases per, per 100,000 residents in a two-week period. Clark County health officials believe that they can meet that criteria to be approved. We'll let you know if they're right. Hi everybody, I'm Matt Spino, and in the weather story today, we're going to talk a little bit climate change, and even though it wasn't a very summery day, summer on average has been starting sooner in Portland. Check out this graphic. By 12 days, if you go back and look at the data going back to about 1970, now the white line is kind of the variability every year, the first day we hit 80 degrees, okay, and that's what we're using in this example. When's the first day we hit 80 degrees? Not that that's the start of summer, but it is the start of our first 80 degree day, right? So if you average that out, that's what the solid brown line is. You can see it is trending downward from 1970 to 2019. From the first day being in May, early May, now it is happening on the other side of May 10th, really around May 1st. So again, about 12 days earlier for our first 80 degree day on average. And of course, we've already had our first 80 degree day so far this year. That of course means that the warm season is getting longer, both on the spring end and on the fall end. The seasons are shifting, and the warm season is lasting longer and longer. Now, many of you may be saying, I could use some of that warm season right now after a cloudy, cool day today where we didn't even hit 60 degrees, let alone 80. But there is 80-degree weather in my seven-day forecast, Dan, 
We'll talk about that coming up at 6.30. So even though we're heading into the unofficial beginning of summer with Memorial Day weekend, we've already had, remember, Mother's Day weekend, we were 87. Yeah. So, yeah, the shift is on. All right, sounds good, Matt. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, and everybody at home, I haven't checked my phone yet. I already know I'm going to hear it from all the Waukeacum County people. I say Waukeacum every time. I, it's like my Achilles heel. I can't help it. I'm sorry. I'm going to say it a thousand times tonight. I'm going to write it on a chalkboard. I won't mess it up again. Now, all this week, we've been talking about the 40th anniversary of Mount St. Helens erupting, and you guys have been still sending in these amazing memories from 1980. I want you to keep it up, please. Uh, you know, don't feel like since it's over, the anniversary has passed, and we don't want to keep hearing them because we do. So use Facebook, use Twitter, and the hashtag HeyDan. We love to see them. In fact, we want to read a few more of them for you right now. From Wink, Hey Dan. 40 years ago today, we were staying down at Nesquin for the weekend. My kids, five and three, were out playing on the beach while we were sitting up in our unit drinking coffee. About 8.40 a.m., we heard three window-rattling booms. I joked, Mount St. Helens! The kids came running inside, wanting to know what the noise was. We thought it must have been blasting for road work, which did seem odd on a Sunday morning. We were at the gift shop later that morning when we heard the news and realized we had heard the eruption. From Gordon. Just after the mountain blew, my dad told me to go out to the car and put a white sock in the inlet of the air cleaner. I thought my dad was crazy. But the next few days later, with six inches of ash on the ground, we drove to the store while other people were having trouble starting their cars. I guess my dad, being that he grew up in Nebraska in the 30s with dust storms, knew what to do. Not so crazy after all. From Jan. Hey, Dan. The photos I have are of one of the after eruptions of steam and ash on July 22nd, 1980. This plume went up 60,000 feet. I took the photos from a Continental Airlines flight from Seattle to Portland. Those of us who had to travel between Portland and Seattle for business got in the habit of carrying cameras and film on the flights so we could get photos of Mount St. Helens. We were getting ready for our descent into PDX when the pilot announced, there it goes again. Everyone knew what he meant. And suddenly everyone was on the east side of the airplane. I had a window seat on the mountainside, so I ended up with a stranger on my lap and more strangers leaning in and handing me their cameras to snap photos for them. The pilot announced he was turning the plane around to go back past the mountain again so the people on the other side of the plane could get a better view. If I'm reading your email, I hope I'm doing them justice. Keep those coming. I want to keep seeing them. And your comments, too. I'm looking through the phone right now. We're going to read a few of them when we come back and finish the story. Okay, uh, I can say somebody emailed us about Marion County entering phase one after getting approval from the governor, and that has in fact happened. So Marion County has give, been given the approval to enter phase one, so that's going to start on Friday, which is big news for anybody in that area. So again, Marion County entering phase one. A lot of people very interested in the kind of, uh, we gave a little bit of information about our coverage on the employment process, the unemployment claims that are going in, and... Uh, I will tell you, as a little bit of a teaser, there is not a whole lot of good news coming out of this. These systems have been entirely and completely overwhelmed. They've had to hire new people. They've had to try and upgrade systems. They've had bugs that have occurred that have come up. And at this point, yeah, they're saying nine out of 10 claims have been processed. But when you have 400,000 claims, that one out of 10 adds up to be a whole lot of people. We're gonna keep pressuring them. We know they're working hard. We know they're trying to do the best work they can but it doesn't mean it makes it any easier to wait for your money. Count on us here at The Story to do our best to report for you. That's it for tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow.